Welcome back. So this morning, everyone, did everyone have a good time? Great. And I'm, I'm sure equally this afternoon, you are going to be in for a treat. And we have many good speakers this afternoon. So first, uh, I'm going to introduce our afternoon keynote speaker, Percy Liang. And Percy is a professor at Stanford University. He is the one who is the creator of the squad data set. And how many of you know about the squad? Yes, I saw many hands. And squad is the uh, data set that helps uh, we to solve the machine reading comprehension problem by giving a machine a text, a paragraph text, and uh, ask a machine questions, like uh, when you take a SAT, take a GRE exam, where how can you, uh, you, they, you are asking to understand the meaning of the text. And so Percy created that they started two years ago. Now um, there's many development on that that basically help the whole community to uh, develop technology on that. Um, but uh, Percy's research goes beyond the just the uh, text understanding. He's doing a lot of work on um, machine uh, AI in security, which you, you probably all heard this morning. So without further ado, I will uh, invite Percy to the podium. Okay, all right. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, the title of my talk is Pushing the Limits of Machine Learning, and it's pushing the limits is kind of deliberately ambiguous. There's two kind of meanings here. One is that we really want to stress test and see what the limitations of our current systems are, and I'll show you some examples where these systems can fail kind of catastrophically. And the second meaning is that we actually want to figure out ways of going beyond these limitations. How can we actually push past these limitations? So, it's kind of no news to anyone of the kind of impact that deep learning AI has had. We see kind of superhuman results on things like the ImageNet uh, competition. Um, but at the same time, we see adversarial examples. This was uh, in the morning's talk, so some of you have seen this, where you can take images and an adversary can perturb it in imperceptible ways and producing the image on the right here Oops. Um, where a state-of-the-art system thinks that the one on the, how do I actually point here? Okay, hold on. New clicker, need to get used to this thing. Um, the one on the left is a temple and the one on the right is an ostrich. So no human would make this mistake, but every single state-of-the-art uh, classifier will cause this to be a problem. And there's security implications of this. So this isn't just a kind of a science experiment. You know, you can have glasses that fool face ID systems. You can have, as we saw this morning, uh, stickers on stop signs that can fool self-driving cars. So this is actually a kind of a serious uh, problem that we have to contend with. What about on natural language processing? So as Julian mentioned, we created a squad a question answering data set two years ago. And the data set is, you know, a fairly kind of uh, canonical um, question answering task where you're given a paragraph from Wikipedia and a question and you want to select a span in the paragraph that answers the question. And um, over the last two years, I personally have been quite um, uh, surprised at kind of the amount of activity and the performance that the current systems have to have where now if you look at the leaderboard, uh, many of the top systems are actually have numbers which are better than the kind of human level, um, uh, the benchmark that we had before. But last year, we showed that these systems might not be doing kind of what you would like. And so he takes, for example, this passage. Um, there is a question, and the current state of our system, Bert, gets the answer correct. But then if you add a sentence at the end, which looks like it answers the question but doesn't actually answer the question, we can actually fool the systems to think that the answer is something that it shouldn't be. So this is not just an isolated incident. If you look at the entire data set across all the models that are on the leaderboard, you see that the accuracy scores drop from superhuman to something that is substantially worse than that. So this is a little bit disturbing because these questions are, um, and while humans are not uh, affected this, uh, by this at all. So clearly there's kind of this gap between um, human level performance and machine level performance if you just kind of measure in the right way. So it's not that 
machines or humans don't make errors. Oh, everyone makes errors. It's the surprisingness of these errors that, of the, the machines that causes uh, some amount of alarm. So in the rest of the talk, I want to go kind of over in broad strokes a set of projects that our research lab has been working on to try to understand and mitigate and defend against these kind of types of problems. Um, so the first class of work is trying to, can we get understanding of um, these systems? Um, so if you take a image classifier, it's you know, a pretty deep neural network, and you ask why does a prediction the way it is. So given an image, why is this a dog? There's been a lot of work trying to understand this. Um, you know, why, what part of the image is most responsible for the dog, or what kind of hidden units are kind of firing in, for, uh, in, in response to a dog and so on. Um, but then the, the question is, well, why does this network exist at all? Where did it come from? So in this, in this paper, we took the question kind of to the next step and asked, okay, where does the model come from? It comes from the training set, right? And I want to kind of emphasize that we talk about kind of uh, models a lot and different types of algorithms, but the real reason and the real behavior of all of these models stems from the training examples you have. The, the model is just kind of a mirror that reflects the what, um, training examples exist, and you can see how this might be potentially problematic because biases in the training data are kind of amplified and reflected in model predictions downstream. So how do we deal with this, uh, this uh, training data? We asked a simple question, which of these examples is kind of most influential in a prediction? So the thought experiment is if you could upweight one of these examples by a little bit and give it a little bit more weight, how would that influence the prediction? And you look at the examples which influence the predictions the most. So this is based on a classical idea in statistics called influence functions from the 70s. And so we use this to kind of understand uh, deep neural networks in a kind of black box way. But it turns out one thing that we didn't anticipate in this project is that understanding means that you can also attack a system. So once you know something really well, you can actually attack it. So we did this experiment where we had um, a, a test example. Here, this, um, this dog with a, a fish there. And you can perturb it, just like in a spirit of adversary example. You perturb it a little bit. And you can change that. And then you retrain on this example instead of this example. And if you don't see any difference between the two, that's because you're human. Um, and once you do that, then the test set all of these dogs uh, are, which were highly classi uh, confidently classified as dog, now they flip to fish, which is pretty disturbing, I think. Um, so, so you can do a lot. There's more we can say about this. Um, but really, I think you know, this is, reveals a problem, but what can we kind of do about these problems? Um, so you can think about what's going on as a game. Right? There's a game between a defender who's trying to train a model that has good accuracy and an attacker who wants to create examples or perturb examples that cause the defender to fail. And um, with any game, it quickly becomes a kind of a cat and mouse game. So since the uh, discovery adversary examples in about 2014, there's been a flurry of work. There's over 100 papers published um, about various types of attacks and defenses and all sorts of different kind of situations. And the problem is that there's no kind of end game to this, because a weaker defense can get defeated by a stronger attack, and then you can have a defense that guards against that attack, but then a stronger attack will defeat that. So we asked the question, can you actually get robustness against all attacks? So in, in kind of when you think about uh, security or cryptography, you don't kind of worry, oh, what happens if a stronger attack? You just kind of mathematically can prove that certain types of uh, you know, protocols are secure, um, and then that's the kind of the end of the thing. So how can we put an end to this arms race? So I won't have time to go into the details, but the basic insight is that if you think about the attack as a kind of a vector in this high dimensional space, it's actually a very intractable uh, quantity to get a handle on. So the best possible attack which you need to defend against is intractable to compute, but we show that using a convex relaxation, we can actually upper bound the damage of the worst 
case attack, and we can push down on that upper bound. And then you can do things like this, where you show as the strength of the attack increases, um, this, the best known attack on this um, MNIST data set um, goes like this, and we can get an upper bound, which guarantees that any future attack cannot get accurate uh, error rates above that. So this gives us some hope. I mean, this is still, I would say, preliminary in terms of how and, and scale, but this gives us some hope that we might be able to um, actually get out of this, um, this loop. So we've seen so far that influence functions can help us understand models and also attack them, and then we can also try to get uh, provable guarantees about you know, security. So let's move to the next topic, which is you know, once we, what is the deep reason for why these uh, systems are kind of failing in this way? And I think about it as really that um, these systems actually don't know a lot about the phenomenon. They're so general purpose. They don't have the kind of the, in, um, they're not really the kind of the right models. Um, and uh, if you think about just uh, doing well on average, you can get away with this. But if you want to really kind of probe the model, you can reveal all these types of weaknesses that you know, we need to do something about. So in the next uh, section, I'm gonna talk about two projects which get at the idea of how can we build models that capture more of the inductive biases, more of the prior knowledge um, that will, we can show will help us um, do more robust prediction, and in particular, do something kind of more unsupervised. Because I think unsupervised learning gives you a way of um, really verifying that your model did the right thing. So here's one project. So the task is um, style transfer. So you're given, at training time, a set of um, reviews about uh, restaurants, and each review is labeled plus or negative. And then at test time, you're given a negative review and you want to transform it into a positive review. So this is doing text generation. But notice that at test time, I don't have any examples of um, here's a negative review and here's a positive review. So this is kind of in an unsupervised um, um, setting. So here's the kind of the approach. And the and, and intuition is that the sentiment of a review can often be localized uh, to a kind of an engrams or phrases in the and the, in the sentences. So that's the first step. We try to kind of mine the different types of phrases which might be indicative. And then the second step, our approach is to take a negative review, let's say, and try to delete the, the ones which are highly indicative of negative sentiment, and then we're gonna to try to fill them back in with a kind of a standard um, LSTM sequence to sequence model um, that puts in kind of positive words. And this is kind of done in a context-dependent way so that um, for example, um, you know, rudeness is a negative word, but we want to replace it with something that is not just positive, but actually can be explained, is used to kind of explain um, you know, people or atmospheres. Okay, so the key idea is that we have this inductive bias of kind of locality that's trying to help us. So we tested this on you know, three data sets, and this is a large table, but the, the kind of the evaluation here is that you have to evaluate uh, three things. You have to evaluate whether the sentence is grammatical, whether it preserves the content, and whether it actually uh, has a target attribute, a positive review or not. And we show that the, the methods that we developed are actually vastly outperforming the ones um, which are um, the best uh, so far in the literature at the time. And one kind of comment is that a lot of these other methods are based on kind of uh, GAN-like approaches where you're trying to train um, um, an adversary that tries to predict the, um, the sentiment and you're trying to train an encoder that removes it. And we found that those are actually really um, uh, brittle and hard to kind of make work, whereas if you have uh, something that is based on the inductive bias, you can actually do a much better job of this. And here's a, just a kind of quick example. Um, we sit down and got some slow and lazy service. We were able to transform it into something that's not quite perfect, but um, we got a very nice place to sit down and got some service, whereas the other methods either uh, change the sentiment but also the meaning or don't really change um, much at all. So here is another project which is kind of different, but I think at the core um, is also about kind of ex uh, generalization and extrapolation. So SAT solving is a, a t canonical task which is um, really useful in my, many, many applications, kind of verification and scheduling. Um, it's intractable, MP hard uh, you know, to solve kind of by def 
um, definition. And it's, um, it can be, but in practice, you can actually solve um, these with uh, lots of heuristics. And one question is we're wondering is can we replace uh, these you know, heuristics with something that's more learned? Okay, so the problem is that you are given a formula and you want to determine whether there's assignment to the variables that make this uh, formula true or that there exists no, no such thing. So we develop a model, and the model is based on, a gr it's a graph-based neural network that does message passing. So you basically encode the variables and the, the clauses as a graph, and then you run this kind of dynamical um, system that passes messages between the variables and the constraints, you can think about this as kind of almost doing a kind of a learned computation. So normally you would design an algorithm, but this is kind of trying to learn the algorithm for approximately um, you know, solving SAT. And this is trying to capture the inductive bias of some popular algorithms like you know, survey propagation, which are known to you know, be effective in certain regimes. Um, so at training time, we give this, um, this algorithm examples of here's an instance and a single bit, whether this instance is satisfiable or not. We're not gonna tell it the solution, whether what, how to set the variables. We're just gonna tell it that this has a solution or does not have a solution. Um, and, and we get 85% you know, accuracy, which is you know, kind of way above um, chance. But the thing that's actually really interesting, if you peer deeper into what the neural network is doing, you kind of see over time, um, you know, the neural net is kind of computing on some things, and there's a kind of a phase transition where kind of a, you can think about it as a kind of an aha moment where it kind of figures out that, oh, here is a, my satisfying assignment, and then, you know, the, the kind of the colors all, you know, change. Um, so if you look at the final hidden states, you can actually read off the solution, right? So, and you can do this in 70 kind of percent of the time. So it's not definitely a perfect SAT solver, and this is not state of the art yet, but it's, it was surprising to us that a uh, neural network that's trained only on the presence or absence of a solution can kind of infer an algorithm that actually can recover the solution in, you know, 70% of the time. And we can show that this also generalizes to larger instances, um, although the performance does degrade. So if you double the number of, of variables that it ever saw at training time, you're still getting kind of 90% of the time you can decode the, the instances. And the more uh, iterations you run, the d dynamic message passing, the better it uh, gets. Okay, so th this, to conclude this kind of part of the talk, we're focusing on how we can um, extrapolate. So we train in kind of one condition, um, and then we test on another condition. And the, uh, the idea is that if a neural net can actually do this task, then it's actually learned something. It's not just kind of doing row memorization or pattern matching where it uh, saw something similar at training time and it's just, you know, copy it. But here it really needs to, we're forcing it to kind of actually learn something about kind of semantics of you know, SAT or something about what is sentiment and what is you know, content here. Okay, so in the f final part of the, of the talk, I want to talk about language. So it's very clear that machine learning has had a dramatic impact on you know, natural language processing, enabling machine translation and, um, you know, question answering and many uh, applications. But what I'm going to be interested in is kind of the reverse direction. So this might be a little bit funny and foreign, but the, the idea is we're trying to think about language as a means to help learning. Um, and, and, and the thing that you should think in your head is that, you know, a lot of machine learning is trying to learn some complicated concept from kind of raw examples. So it has to do a lot of work. It has to infer all the patterns and build um, up from kind of raw experience in some sense. But you look at the way kind of, uh, you know, human learns, there is a lot of that too. But there's also language. We invented this wonderful system that allows you to not have to go hit, get in the street and get hit by a car a million times to figure out that's a bad idea, but, you know, you can kind of communicate, your mom tells you, okay, cars are dangerous, you know, don't go in the street, and you can kind of use language to basically transmit knowledge in a kind of a much more eff efficient way than to try to learn everything from scratch. And this is something I think we take for granted, but I think it's an insight that we're going to try to leverage here. So here's one example of a project that we were 
um, looking at here. So the, the setting here is we're trying to interpret natural language commands. So add two chairs five spaces apart. And we want a, a system that can actually build the thing. You want to transform into a sequence of actions where you can you know, put blocks together and so on. And this is, if you had you know, a million examples of just examples of um, chairs and sentences, this, this would actually be a very hard uh, you know, task to solve. Um, because the kind of this action sequence that you need to conduct this is you know, very, um, very large. But if you were trying to teach a human how to, how to do this, what would you do? Well, you might say, okay, what, what does that mean? That means add a chair, move five spaces to the left, add another chair. Okay, but maybe you don't know what chair means. So let's say, okay, what is a chair? A chair has four legs, add, you add the chair base, and then you add the chair back, and, and so on. Right, so, and then maybe you don't know leg, what legs means, and you can kind of dive down further. So in this way, you can kind of explain using natural language these concepts in kind of a much more structured way than trying to just throw the, all the data at kind of a wall and see what kind of sticks. So we built this interface, and it looks like this. So um, users use the system to build various sculptures. And the way it works is that the user uh, communicates the system only using natural language. And if the system understands, great. If the system doesn't understand, the, the user can teach the system on the fly um, and say, okay, here's how you add a yellow palm tree. You can kind of execute, explain the steps, and then the system now gets a little piece of information that it can improve on the fly. So now next time the user says that, the system has a better chance of being able to understand that and so on and so forth. So we ran this uh, experiment on Amazon Mechanical Turk. So over the course of three days, we had about 40 users come and we gave them uh, instructions, uh, some kind of sample of things to build, but then let them kind of um, just be creative and build various sculptures. We had a leaderboard and everything. Um, and I personally was quite impressed by the kind of creative ability of some of these um, workers. Um, they were certainly, these are things I, I couldn't do. Um, they were able to build all sorts of kind of sculptures and in the process teaching the system kind of what you know, ship or a chair and all these things meant. So one thing that I want to kind of, you know, th this project has kind of many different angles. The thing, thing I'm trying to illustrate here is that by uh, allowing your s kind of changing the paradigm, so to speak, from kind of just having input output pairs to kind of a more interactive one where you can build up concepts incrementally over time can allow you to kind of achieve a lot you know, more than if you were constrained by the kind of the standard framework. And it also I think uh, illustrates another point about natural language which is that language is, um, is not just text on the, on the page that you want to analyze but it's a mechanism for users to be able to communicate with systems and uh, it's kind of something that evolves and adapts organically. Both the system and the user kind of adapt at the same time. Okay, so just to kind of summarize, we talked about three different kind of areas. In the first area, we talked about how we can understand better what these deep neural networks are doing because at, this, at the kind of supervisual level, they're just, you know, lots of, you know, uh, neurons and connections and we, really can't understand them very in the kind of the uh, in a classical way. So we have to develop tools to do this. We also saw that we can defend against adversary examples, at least in some setting, by appealing to kind of more um, optimization where we can guarantee that adversaries can't exceed a certain error threshold. So in the second part of the talk, we talked about how we want to have models that can extrapolate. Some models that can't, don't just kind of do um, what is given to it at training time. We saw that in SAO transfer, we give a model examples of movies, uh, not movies, um, reviews and their, um, their sentiment. And at test time, we're giving a completely different task of transforming a negative review into a positive review. And in the neural uh, sat um, solving case, we're, we saw how we could, at training time, just give a single bit of supervision, which is whether this, a, a instance was satisfiable or not, and at test time, we can actually decode the actual assignment. And then finally, we saw how natural language might be 
a way to um, inject some of this inductive bias. So part of the problem why systems can be sometimes brittle is that it doesn't know what you're trying, it can't read your mind. It can't know exactly what are spurious correlations and what, are the, what is the true signal. But sometimes using language, we can kind of communicate these beliefs directly and that can be a very kind of powerful thing. So two parting questions. So limits. What, I think we're still kind of living in a very exciting era. I think there are every um, you know, few months we see kind of ad advances and higher accuracies and you know, there's been a flurry of new data sets. And so there's a question of you know, where this is all going. And you know, I, I don't think anyone kind of can maybe predict the, the future, but I think there's still a lot of uh, um, you know, promise for kind of improvement. Um, at the same time, I think it's really important that we focus on the issue of kind of robustness, especially when these systems are going out into more kind of mission critical situations like self-driving cars or medical diagnostics or you know, in kind of insecurity. And we see that these systems are, have these uh, vulnerabilities that make them very susceptible. And you think about you know, the attack surface of um, machine learning systems is huge and it's an area that's still very nascent and we kind of don't quite understand that. So, so I think uh, active area of research in the machine learning community is to really get a handle on this. And I think to do that, you have to revisit some of the first principles and you know, build up kind of robust systems from the you know, ground up. Um, so with that, I will uh, conclude. So all our code and data is on this platform, which we build called CoLab Worksheets, which allows for kind of reproducible experiments. I want to thank all my uh, students and collaborators and funding sources. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Percy. Now we are open to the audience for questions. We, because we start late, we may only go for one or two questions. So the first one over there. Yeah. Sorry, a very trivial question, probably don't take much time. So I heard the BERT is pretty powerful. Is that yeah. open sourced? <laughs> is, what's the question? Uh, BERT. Yeah, BERT. Uh, BERT, yeah, is it open sourced? I yeah. kind of searched a little bit, didn't find it. So what about, what is the question about BERT? The BERT model, basically all the ABI, all basically, you know, can I just use it? Yeah, so BERT, uh, I mean, is this uh, thing that was, came out of Google AI, for, for those of you who don't know, that is able, basically you use a large amount of uh, <coughs> training data to pre-train um, contextual word embeddings and it allows you to bump up the accuracy on many state of our NLP tasks. So this is a very powerful technique and um, I think people should use this if they want to kind of increase the the accuracy of these models. Um, one thing I do want to point out is that it doesn't solve the kind of robustness issue because we actually ran the BERT model on that a question answering example and even BERT was not able to answer that you know, correctly. So um, that's a kind of an orthogonal di direction. One, one, more, one more question, one last question over there. Very nice presentation. Uh, so I just have one question about uh, in uh, one of your results, uh, you had compared uh, different iterations of the model with uh, the actual human. And even the humans did not have like 100% uh, scores. So I was wondering like what was actually the, how the ground truth was created. Because the humans are also not uh, able to do like 100%, uh, so. Yeah, so that's a good question. So the ground truth was created by having uh, several humans trying to answer the same question and then seeing how much they agree, essentially. So humans obviously make errors and some of the questions are hard and also we're using mechanical, you know, Turks, so there's some noise there. Um, so, but, but in uh, many of these cases, the human level accuracy is still, you know, of way above the, the kind of this, the best system accuracy in other cases, as you saw, the system was actually above the humans because it's actually probably doing some form of denoising. Great, let's, let's thank uh, Percy for the talk. <laughs> <laughs>